Hey folks, Dr. Jamar Tisby here for Footnotes, and I just want to give you a little introduction to this special episode. A few weeks ago, Professor Julie Moore reached out to me about her story of her contract not being renewed at Taylor University, a Christian university in Indiana. The cause, the reason given for her contract not being renewed after decades of teaching was about racial justice. There was criticism about her composition class, which was themed on racial justice. And in particular, uh, there were some quotes of mine. Now, she did not assign any of my books or writings in the actual syllabus. She was just quoting from me to help frame the theme of her composition class. So in this episode, we talk to Professor Julie. She walks us through in detail the story of what happened, which includes a lot of breaches of protocol. Things were not followed or on the up and up, uh, completely blindsided her as far as this entire ordeal that she is still currently in. And she courageously decided to go public with her story, which will um, most likely result in her immediate dismissal. So just a point of clarification, uh, she is currently teaching there, but her contract was not renewed for the upcoming year. But they said they, she could go ahead and complete the semester. But by her publicizing this on footnotes and other outlets, uh, that prospect of her even finishing the semester is greatly in jeopardy. Uh, she expects that she'll be fired immediately for, for going public. But just like Professor Sam uh, Jockel, who I've interviewed on this in a similar instance in his ordeal at Palm Beach Atlantic University, it is critical that we bring these instances of academic repression, particularly around issues of racial justice, we bring them to light. Because as we talk about in this episode, it's only by bringing these issues to light that they can perhaps be addressed and maybe healed and repaired. And so please listen. Uh, it's a very somber story. Um, and they do have an action, a call to action at the end that they're inviting other Christian colleges and universities to, to get in on. Um, but I am particularly keen to share these stories because there's a real human impact and there's a real cost for confronting racism instead of being complicit with it. Here's my interview with Professor Julian. Moore. Hey folks, welcome to another episode of Footnotes. I'm your host, Dr. Jamar Tisby. And once again, we have a very sobering story um, yet it's one that needs to be told. I'm here with Professor Julie Moore. Welcome to Footnotes. Thank you, Jamar. I appreciate your support and being here. Well, thank you for reaching out to me. Uh, we'll get into your story in a moment. For folks who are just meeting you for the first time, can you tell us a little bit about your position um, and what brings you here? Well, I'll I'll dive right in as we discussed. Uh, you also interviewed Sam Jockel, and we followed his story um, through the last couple months. And weeks before Sam, who is a renowned C.S. Lewis scholar, was met by his provost outside his classroom door at Palm Beach Atlantic and asked to hand over his freshman comp syllabus. I had already lost my job at Taylor University for the same reason Sam was about to lose his job. And as I watched Sam's story unfold in the press and watched your interview and read articles about it, I just could not believe how similar our situations were. He had taught a racial justice unit in his composition course for 12 years at Palm Beach Atlantic with nary a problem. And I had been teaching my composition course with a theme of racial justice at both an HBCU, which was Wilberforce University and two other universities for over 30 years and never had had a problem, just never. And I had not only been positively reviewed at all these places, but I had enjoyed pro, uh, promotions 
And I was always issued annual contracts without fail. So most recently at Taylor, I had undergone a professional review in the fall of 2021. And I had, as a result of that review, been issued um, contract renewal because of a unanimous department vote and support letters from my chair. Uh, I had three interims that year. So it was my interim chair, my interim dean, and my interim provost at the mm -hmm. time. And in the fall of 2020, or it was either fall or spring of 2020, but in 2020, that um, interim provost had been my dean. And he set up a written and stipulated in writing the protocol that we were all to follow for my review. I suppose to uh, put a portfolio of all my materials, all syllabi. I'm also a writing center director, so all my writing center materials as well. On Blackboard, my department was to read everything thoroughly, so was the chair dean and my academic enrichment supervisor at the time. And then after the department would interview me, I was supposed to be interviewed by my chair and my dean and my AEC, my academic enrichment supervisor. And then, you know, a decision would be made on my contract. And that followed the faculty handbook too, because the chair and the dean were supposed to make the final decisions. And just so folks are clear about the academic system, uh, Taylor yeah. <laughs> doesn't have a, a tenure uh, process, but they have contracts that are for certain terms. And every so often, you your contract comes up for review. They they look at this portfolio of material. Folks get together, collaborate, decide if and for how long to renew that contract. Um, well, actually, at Taylor, there there is tenure. Okay. And there is a tenure review process. So that makes it different from Palm Beach Atlantic, where no one can get tenure. So at Taylor, uh, the veteran professors do have tenure. They do have that safety and security. And Taylor has a long history of academic freedom and open and civil discourse on a variety of issues. It has just always been a place that's known for that. And, and in it's fact, I, attached to what denomination or, or tradition? Taylor was actually founded by a Methodist um, um, minister, but... Uh, whose name is Taylor, of course. But um, over the years, it has become known as a non-denominational evangelical university. But our students come from all walks of life. Yeah. We have Catholic students and Episcopalian students and many evangelical students. The faculty, though, have to sign a standard, you know, faith statement and sure. agreement with the doctrine and things like that. So tenure does exist. Um, and there is a tenure process outlined in the faculty handbook, but I was hired uh, as a non-tenure track faculty member. So my process had to be stipulated because I'm I'm more of a rare bird here, if if you will. So there is a process in that handbook that's about a sentence, <laughs> maybe two uh -huh. sentences about how non-tenure review faculty should be reviewed. So my dean graciously at the time, you know, said, hey, let's talk about this and we'll actually spell out the steps. And at the end, he put in that protocol that, you know, uh, we'll we'll treat you like because of your vast experience, and everything else, as long as your review is good, we'll then treat you like post tenure reviews because faculty also get post tenure reviews here. And so you'll just be reviewed every seven years. Great. So I went through my process in 2021. I did get a question about my theme and comp, um, and it did cause a little bit of tension in the faculty meeting, but the, the colleague ended up apologizing to me, and it was all water under the bridge, and it wasn't a big deal. And um, I am very sensitive, so I had you know many students thanking me for the class saying, oh, thank you for explaining why people are protesting. Thank you for you know having us write about this, read about this. But I always had a couple of complaints here or there, and so in my review, when um, I got to the end of the process uh, and the interviews were supposed to be with my academic enrichment supervisor, my dean, and my chair, but instead the protocol wasn't followed and it ended up being with the three interims, including the interim provost, mm -hmm. um, you know, I communicated, hey, I'm still trying to reach these other students. Like, I, I want to reach these students that for some reason 
just get really angry about the course content, even though I'm telling them they're allowed to have their views. And I've always told students that you're allowed to have your views. And I heard Sam say something similar on, on his podcast with you, you know, you're allowed to have your views, but this is a writing class. So you're learning college level writing. That means you're learning college level rhetoric. You can't just rant. Mm. You can't just sound like a cable news TV host, whether on the left or the right. right. You can't just yell at people. You have to treat opposing views with respect and sensitivity. And there's a way to do this. And I'm going to teach you how to do this. But I'm also going to expose you to a lot of a writing by acclaimed authors, some of whom are going to be authors. Maybe you've never read before. Maybe you have, but most of my students hadn't. So they they read an essay by ta Coates. They read an essay by Claudia Rankin. They have read essays by Amy Tan and Julia Alvarez and other such notable authors, you know, so that so that they understand, look, there is something I'm doing here intentionally. I'm, I, I am going to try to decenter whiteness here. Mm. I am going to try to you're right. It's college. So you should learn about what other viewpoints are. And Taylor has a multicultural philosophy statement. So uh, and I and we have to sign by it every year. So I thought, great, you know, I'm going right to put that, put that in my syllabus. And we're going to we're going to read multicultural authors and you'll write literacy narratives and every, you know, other kinds of college level essays. So he's always teaching writing. So, so this, anyway, is a, just, this is a composition class. Freshman, did you say? Yes, mostly, yeah. but sometimes, you know, upperclassmen you know, sneak yeah. in there. They don't get it as freshmen. And the specific topic of this composition course is is around racial justice, multiculturalism, those kinds yeah. of, what, what did you it, call it? Yeah, so um, there, in composition and rhetoric scholarship, which is my field, um, there has always been a plethora of scholarship on thematic composition classes, teaching mm -hmm. composition classes on a theme. Yeah. Many, I mean, myriad professors teach comp this way. So my theme, because of my Wilberforce years, has always been to touch on racial justice. Because when I went to Wilberforce, I was straight out of grad school. I had attended predominantly white churches, lived in a predominantly white community, um, you know, went to predominantly white schools. And honestly, I was one of those clueless white people who... Right. I went through culture shock when I landed there. But for 10 years, you know, people were gracious with me. People were inclusive to me, loving to me and really taught me, you know, there is a parallel universe in this nation. And yes, we're here to show you that you've been living in one universe. We're in a parallel universe. And it it had a profound effect on me. And Wilberforce although, is a historically black college. Yes, yeah. and and named after William Wilberforce, built along the Underground Railroad in Southwest Ohio. And I, although I couldn't continue at Wilberforce because of a lot of reasons that we don't need to get into, but it just had to do with the school went through some trying times. Um, it's doing much better now. But you know, when I left that school, I thought I will never not teach this because mm. my students deserve to know the truth and if i'm going to be in christian higher ed the one thing we should be doing is teaching the truth Come on. Yeah. if you had told me 20 years ago if you had told me 10 years ago if you had even told me five years ago mm. that you could lose a job for teaching truth at a christian university i would not have believed you mm. i still can't believe this has happened to me so anyway, to just back to that review process, I don't know if we close that loop, but yeah, no, we keep going. But, but yeah. that was it. That was a critical <laughs> yeah. point. And I do want to pause here yeah. because I think it's 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 super important to know how formative an HBCU was to your understanding yes. of racial just racial justice. Absolutely. And more broadly, being immersed in a majority black institution and yes. community, which very few white people in general and even fewer professors right. in the higher right. ed uh have that opportunity to do right um so you know to to the listeners out there she's right there are parallel universes yes it intersects in some <laughs> ways we have to react to whatever's going on in this right, right, other right. universe but there is so much information perspectives different questions author right. content that you're exposed to in an environment where black people are free to talk about and think about what we need to in our own way that it can hardly be expressed you have to see it you have to experience it so i encourage people at least visit some black yes. 
at yes. least take a black history class, right? Those kinds of things. So I just right I, and I, go go to the museums. You yes. know, if you're in Southwest Ohio, go to the Underground Railroad Museum in Cincinnati. If you're near DC or just make it your spiritual pilgrimage because it will be a spiritual encounter to go to the Smithsonian's National African American Museum um, in in DC, which Kevin Young, whom I got to hear just last week, he was in Indianapolis, you know, directs, you know, take advantage of these opportunities and, and read and really dive in. Because when I was at Wilberforce, it was the first time I had any African American administrator. Mm. It was the first time I ever had an African American supervisor. It was the first time I ever had African American colleagues. Now I was young because I was fresh out of grad school, but my and and it was definitely the it wasn't the first time I'd ever had an African American student because I had taught a little bit uh, in grad school. I was a teaching assistant. But it was definitely a learning experience for me to have a hundred percent of my students be African American or biracial, you know, people of color. And I learned I not only didn't have all the answers, I didn't have most of the answers. <laughs> and I need I needed to listen. Yes. I needed to practice what James said, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and even slower to anger. Mm. And that's really what I've been teaching my students at Taylor. And before that, my previous school where I was at, like, I just want you to read in order to listen, yeah. not read. Like we have this thing in America where everybody is entitled to their opinion. There's no doubt about that. But that doesn't mean every opinion is informed. Mm. It doesn't mean that that every opinion is valid. It really doesn't. Because if you have never done the hard work of really listening to other people's perspectives and experiences, and again, that doesn't mean that at the end of the day, you're going to vote for the same candidate or agree on the same policy discussions. But if you don't know first how to listen and how to practice what, you know, the Bible even teaches us, right, about listening first, about esteeming others as more important than us, mm. um, about sharing <laughs> you know, uh, wealth so that we're not Ananias and Sapphira and saying, yep, I gave and then struck down, down dead, right? I mean, we want, we, we need to be other focused. And so to me, reading is like listening. And that's what I teach my students to do. Just read the perspectives and reflect on it. And, you know, the vast majority of students dug in, deeply engaged, and were very positive. But again, during that preview, I just pulled, I can't believe I just did that. I just pulled a piece of my dog's hair off my computer. <laughs> so that's what that was. It um, so um, as I taught here, you know, during my review process, again, there were a couple students that just did not seem capable or willing to do that. Every every article they read, it, whether it was Tom Hossico's letter to my son or uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter to a Birmingham jail, or Frederick Douglass's What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, mm -hmm. or Amy Tan's article on bad English, you know, mm -hmm. uh, whatever the case may be, there'd always be, you know, one or two students in the class who, who would just be angry. And they would write things in their journals or their papers about like, this is absurd, this is ridiculous, they're exaggerating. Um, oh, well, you know, all of history has been violent. What are you going to do? Wow. You know, and I'm paraphrasing here very loosely, but my point just being in my, in that, in my review, like I'm very open to constructive criticism. I'm like, what can I do to reach such students? Well, in the interim provost support letter, which was very positive, and you know this by now, I think maybe we should tell your listeners, like I can corroborate everything I'm saying. Like I, have the support letters, I've shared them with you. I have the protocol, I shared that with you. Um, and the support letters are very, very positive, but the provost just made a suggestion like, well, you know, maybe you could use some Heritage Foundation materials, you know, to reach those students. And what is the Heritage uh, Foundation? <laughs> Tell us about them. I thought it was an odd suggestion. One, because oh. the Heritage Foundation is by its own website, right? A conservative, the right wing think tank in DC. Hmm. And so they exist to put forth their ideology. Um, and I was teaching a class that was 
along the lines of the multicultural philosophy statement. I was just asking students to listen to the life experiences of people that maybe they have not had much of a chance to interact with. Because many of my students, certainly not all, but many of my students at Taylor, which is a PWI, it's a predominantly white institution in a PW state, a predominantly white state of Indiana, that a lot of them have come from very small towns. And they would tell me, they're like, I, I didn't meet a black person until I came to Taylor. I never mm -hmm. met a Japanese person until I came to Taylor. And we have international suits, you know. Um, and so I just wanted to say, hey, you know, now that you're at college, let's talk about, you know, people outside of the bubble. You know, college campuses tend to have their own bubble. People, you know, I lived in a small town for 30 years. I know what the bubble is. Like, it's very easy to become, right, very cloistered. Sure. And not really think through the perspectives of others. But, yeah, so... Um, so along those lines, I was just asking students to listen in order to learn and then to reflect and to respond. And I, I would always tell my students, you know, the first five weeks of the class, I'm teaching you close reading skills. I'm teaching you how to annotate that reading. So we don't even start writing for the after, until about a week, week and a half into the class. And even then, it's just journaling, mm -hmm. you know, so they're not doing anything high risk. And it's about reflection. It's about responding. And it's about like, I just want them to show me. I am willing to listen. Mm -hmm. So, and I tell them, argument is a very difficult, complex skill. We're going to get there, but not in the very beginning of the class. And so, uh, even this past year, because like, so anyway, sorry, I keep, I keep losing, losing. The, there's so much to the, say. The, but, I know there's yeah, so much to it's... say. But anyway, the interim provost made that suggestion in in his letter, and I only mention it because this ended up being like the crux the of thing. why I ended up losing my job. Okay. So I talked, I talked to my chair, and again, the review process was very positive. Got a unanimous vote, all positive support letters. So I got another contract. Um, talked to my chair about that Heritage Foundation um, suggestion, and he agreed. Like it was kind of odd. It wasn't. Um, really relevant because I'm not teaching a class on policy mm -hmm. um, and that he's like, it's just a suggestion, Julie. He said, you know, you don't have, you don't have to follow it because it doesn't really make sense anyway. Um, and Tom was just trying to help you because you had expressed that you want to reach, you know, the students who tend to be more angry and just like help them feel, you know, I guess less threatened or whatever the case was. So um, I ended up then um, applying for and receiving the second of two grants I had gotten through our Center for Teaching and Learning Excellence here to do more research into what's called in my field, the field of composition and rhetoric, linguistic justice. Mm -hmm. And that's just really researching how does language both uh, liberate and um, sometimes um, right, uh, uh, limit and restrict and even oppress people, different people mm -hmm. groups. And so I came out of that and I thought, okay, you know, what I want to do now is I, I really want to go in the direction of literacy narratives. So I'm going to have students read acclaimed authors' own narratives of how they learned English, how they learned to write, why they write, things like that. And then students can write their own literacy narratives, how they learn to write or speak mm -hmm. or read. And the papers were wonderful. And I assigned authors, you know, like I said, Amy Tan, Julia Alvarez, George Orwell's written a famous essay on why I write, um, and a variety of other, you know, acclaimed authors. Uh, James Baldwin got in there because he wrote about why Black English is a real English, which went, mm. you know, right with what we were talking about. I'm going to need so your the, reading list. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. So, so the students wrote beautiful, I mean, really moving literacy essays, and um I thought, wow, that was that was really good, and um, it seemed to, it seemed to be a way into the same kinds of themes, but through a back door and maybe a door that was, um, for whatever reason, right, less threatening, so more more uh, not not so maybe politically charged for some of the students, for whatever the case was. But anyway, and then you know we go into a second unit where they learn how to write a critique a review an evaluation so they learn the principles now they build on the principles of reflection and listening and they build into that critical thinking skills of analysis interpretation and evaluation 
in the past, uh, when I taught in Ohio, I used to take my students to the National Afro-American Museum, which is in Wilberforce. Mm. It's actually the, our nation's first National Afro-American Museum before the later ones opened. And it's a small museum, so it's very doable to take a class over there, be over there for two or three hours, get a tour, and then they could review an exhibit. Um, I've also had students review graphic novels. Lately, since the pandemic, we've been doing documentary films because they can access them mm. right right on their computer. So, so then we do that. And then the last uh, unit is about the research paper, and they have to learn argumentative skills. And that's where they can dig in. And if they want to choose a policy issue, they can. But they have to they have to read and take notes from peer reviewed research, and they have to really employ those strategies that are befitting a college level research paper. Um, and so it is a writing class, like through and through. It's a writing class. They're learning all the skills necessary for college level writing. I'm the writing center director. Why would I not be teaching writing in my writing class? Make right? your own job harder. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, in fact, I, there are several students each year I'm able to pluck right out of my comp classes to work as tutors in the writing center because they evidence such skills. So all that to say, I had my review in fall 2021. It went well, got another contract. I was concerned that the protocol wasn't followed exactly, that it was supposed that that my academic enrichment supervisor to whom I report for the writing center got cut out of the process immediate uh, completely. Yeah. And the interim provost inserted himself in the process when he wasn't supposed to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, my chair, like I said, I talked to my chair about everything. He's like, look, you had one of the most positive reviews of anyone. It's stellar. Your letters are stellar. We'll just make sure we follow it seven years from now. And then <laughs> January 27th of this year happened wow. and I was called into the provost's office and I was told in no uncertain terms that because my composition class doesn't actually teach writing and because my composition class lacks balance in terms of the uh, ass assignments, which was never actually really defined, but he kept referring back to you didn't do what you were told to do in that letter that told you to assign Heritage Foundation materials. Like that was the reference he just kept going back to. Wow. And I, I just kept saying, wait a minute, how can you know, he was like, you don't really teach writing. You've made it into a sociology of race class. And I was like, what what is going on here? Like I, I was in utter shock. Um, And I just. You know, I kept pressing him and pressing him and pressing him. And I kept saying, no, my class does all of this. And then he'd back off and he'd say, well, I'm not saying none of the class is about writing. I'm just saying that, you know, you're, you're, you don't, you know, do what you're supposed to do in the class. So I kept pressing and I kept pressing. And I suppose we should tell your listeners too, <laughs> I recorded that meeting. So again, I can corroborate all of this that says it is legal in Indiana to record a conversation or a meeting, as long as there's one party consent, I consented so I could record it. So, and I have a transcript of it, you know, so I keep myself very consistent with the facts. You have the receipts. I have the receipts, <laughs> yeah. And um, I finally pressed him, and you know this part too, because this is why I'm talking to you. I, I pressed him finally, and I said to him, Okay, what materials are you talking about that you wanted me to balance out? You know, like what materials are you talking about? And at first he's like, well, I don't want to get into specifics or whatever. And I just kept pushing him. And I said, well, what one in particular are you like, can you give an example? And he eventually said, and I'm looking for it because I, I thought I would quote it if I could. Yeah, he, he said, um, I, at one point, I pressed Maxwell for specific details, that's the name of our provost, asking him what materials I'd assigned that he had found objectionable. He would not name any, but I kept pressing him further, and then he finally blurted, Jamar Tisby is the main focus. There it is. What? And I thought, that, that was my response in my head. I didn't say it out loud, but I thought, oh, there it is. That's what we're really talking about here. I see. So I actually responded to him and I told you when I first contacted you, sorry, Jamar, I don't actually 
assign any materials by you. <laughs> <laughs> which I told the provost, I said, I don't actually assign anything by TISB. To which she immediately responded, yes, you do. I saw it on your Blackboard class. Well, the MS, LMS, and for non-college instructors, an LMS is a learning management system. So some schools use Canvas, some use Brightspace, some use Moodle. We use Blackboard. Well, I had changed my LMS over the summer when I did the research into linguistic justice. I also did research into a brand new LMS, and I used Macmillan's Achieve. So I was using Achieve in the fall. I don't know what he was looking at. Mm. The so, only uh, thing on the Blackboard was my syllabus. Okay. So I do quote you in my syllabus. I quote the wonderful quotation you have, which I view as thoroughly biblical from the color of compromise. The refusal to act in the midst of injustice is itself an act of injustice. Indifference to oppression perpetuates oppression. History and scripture teach us that there could be no reconciliation without repentance. There could be no repentance without confession. And there could be no confession without truth. Hmm. That's what was quoted on the syllabus. And that's what he found objectionable, I guess, because that's what he named. Well, and he argued with me. He's like, I have seen the materials you assigned Jamar Tisby. He's the main focus of your course. I was like, I don't assign anything by Tisby. Believe me, I would have loved to. But I didn't want to assign my students to have to buy another book. We, we already have a textbook, which was another thing I told the provost. I use a writer's reference by Diana Hacker and Nancy Summers. And Nancy Summers has since taken over all the editing because Hacker passed away quite a while ago from cancer. I mean, the book's been around for 30 years. It's a mainstay. It's a writing book. Class. Yeah. It's a writing. It's, it's not it's a, a sociology of race book. All the paper assignments, the literacy narratives in there, the multimodal text review, which right now is a film review is in there the research papers in there. Yeah. What are you talking about? So he had somehow um, gone on, he didn't know anything really about your course. He had somehow gone on this management system that you weren't using that only had the syllabus on it. And correct. What, you know, every syllabus basically has an opening kind of narrative to frame the class. Sure, sure. And he, he, he maybe read that or heard from somebody who read that. Right, and, right. Because I had in the syllabus look. Yeah, I mean, I put my syllabus, I don't, I don't try to trick students. So I put my syllabus, look, we have a course theme. Yeah. Here's the theme. Yeah. And I had a quotation from you. I had a quotation from Baldwin, had a quotation from two of the leading scholars in linguistic justice in my field, Dr. April Baker Bell, whose book on Black English is just phenomenal. And um, has, she's made tremendous contributions. The whole field of composition and rhetoric is, you know, being led by these people. And Dr. Geneva Smitherman, who uh, also is a scholar in the field. And, um, but he didn't mention any of those. I, I'm kind of surprised he picked on you, but he didn't say James Baldwin, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but no, it was you, it was you. Maybe that was only, the, maybe that was the only name he could remember. I don't yeah. know. I do like to give people the benefit of the doubt, sure. but it was surreal. So, like to be, to have him insisting that I teach materials you've written and assign materials that you've written when I actually don't and never have. It just has never fit into the class the way I do the class. Because again, I'm not looking at policy and also I'm not teaching sociology and also I'm not teaching history. And your books are about policy, sociology, and history. So I'm not assigning that. I'm assigning writing by acclaimed creative writers, writers of creative nonfiction, writers of poetry, writers of, you know, um, you know, the, the wonderful writer, you know, like Amy Tan from the Joy Luck Club, like she's written essays on learning English and her mother's English. That's a great essay to assign. Well, I don't know if to be to apologize or to cheer <laughs> if uh, <laughs> I played some part in your dismissal. Um... <laughs> I know. So this is your claim to fame. And I thought after it was all said and done, and I realized, wow, I am not going to get my job back. Like, he's just going to be insistent. He just would not change his mind. At the end, after I just, I did everything I could to refute every accusation he threw at me, he actually said, I'll pray about it. I'll think about it. I'll take these things under consideration. Because I kept saying, I had a positive review. I had a stellar review. I'm not saying it was perfect, but it resulted in a unanimous vote to continue my contract. It resulted in three 
extremely positive support letters that didn't have a negative thing to say about me, yeah. but it had that one suggestion and he was zeroing in on that one suggestion. And the fact that it was Heritage Foundation, it's just so bizarre. Yeah, yeah. And so th that meeting, was that the meeting where you found yeah. out you dismissed? Yeah, I got a really vague email on January 26th. And the email just said something along the lines of, hey, can we get this meeting in before spring semester begins? <laughs> Whoa. And I thought, what is going on? Why am I being called to the provost's office? Because we have a January term. So this was the day in between the end of the January term and the beginning of spring. My, my, my. And I asked my academic enrichment supervisor here. He's like, I have no idea what's going on, but I, I, I got called to the meeting too. Well unbeknownst to me until after that meeting, my chair was never involved. Mm -hmm. And I found out from my chair and my academic enrichment director, neither one was consulted. Mm -hmm. Neither one was told what was going to happen. So the provost went around them completely. Um, this and is, that's the other thing that gets me about your situation, Professor Sam's situation, other situations that I'm sure are out there is you know, just from a very basic protocol level, a very basic right. HR level, that things are not being followed. And then for, for this to be a Christian institution, right? Yeah. Like integrity and character matter. And, yeah. you know, it, it's just very telling that in these processes, processes aren't actually followed. They're somehow yeah. circumvented. There are exceptions made. It's not all done by the book, by their own stated protocols and right and that's always very revealing now sometimes mistakes happen whatever but sometimes it's because they know that something and i'm not saying this is what you're thinking this is what jamar's thinking yeah they know okay. there's something that um there's something that's not on the up and up that that at the very least their case is tenuous and so they yeah. go through all of the necessary steps because if 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 they did it would actually come to light that hey there's no substance behind it you know, right. it actually reminds me of what you were saying about your students, where you can't just rant, you can't just vent, you can't just have an opinion that's not informed and backed up, you know, yeah. think whatever you want. But in these contexts, you have to have supporting evidence, which it seems to me there was a lack of. But you go in this meeting on the right. 27th and, right. come out and, and you don't have a job. Yeah. And I come out, and I don't have a job. And the first person I called was my chair. And she had been teaching in London, so she, but she was back and she was back in time to go. And she was in shock. She mm -hmm. had not been invited to the meeting and she mm -hmm. had not been consulted. And I was just, I was a mess. I mean, I'm very, you know, together today for the most part, but I mean, I must've cried nonstop for a week. Like I, I was heartbroken. I never anticipated that Taylor would act in this way because Taylor's history is not this way. Yeah. And, you know, I, so she immediately wanted to advocate for me. She was livid that, you know, he'd gone around her and I shouldn't speak for her, but I mean, I know if asked, she would say that, um, but she, she um, and the director of the academic enrichment center here, they both were just, they were beside themselves, you know, um, there was just no there was no just cause. Well, there was a, there was an email that, you know, I, I called my former chair who had been the interim chair the year before too. I called him as well. And he said, he was actually the first person I called in fact, cause he had written the support letter. Then I called my other chair. But anyway, he said he was shocked that he couldn't believe they did this. Cause he had also reassured me at the time when the review was over, look, they can never question again, you know, why you're doing what you're doing because it was so clear that you are gospel driven, mm. that you are teaching this class because you truly believe all are created in the image of God. Every life matters yes. and that we will do our own students an injustice if we don't teach them to consider the viewpoints of many different people, especially people of color who've been oppressed in particular in this country, both, you know, in the past and present. Dr. And G. I, yeah. You know, so anyway, so I then talked to a couple of other veteran faculty, 
people who had been, we do have a faculty council. It doesn't have much power, but it is nice. It, 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 like, it does give us representation. It leads all the faculty meetings. And I contacted several people there and I said, what do I do? And some said, we'll check out the grievance process. Well, that was a non-starter for various reasons I won't get into because we're limited by time, but it just, it, it was a process where like to file a grievance, you had to file it with the provost. <laughs> the provost was the problem. And then if, if it's the grievance is against the provost, you have to file it to the president, but our president and our provost have come from the same place, Gordon college. So it was like, like they've got each other's back. Right. So I, I figured maybe I'm wrong about that, but I figured there just was no point in it. So anyway, after talking and trying to get counsel, like, do I have any recourse at all? Um, I got an email then, and this is this is like February 2nd, I think, from the provost. And it was so bizarre. He's And he said in the email, I think I have it here. Yeah, he said, this is a follow-up to our meeting on Friday, January 27th. At the beginning of the meeting, I stated that the expectation was for the meeting to remain confidential among those in the room, as if I wasn't allowed to even talk to my chair. But I, I immediately thought, no, 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 I recorded the meeting. I know you didn't say that. And then the email goes on. I also noted this at another point in the meeting when I explained my desire to support a positive transition. So he's claiming to have told me twice in that meeting that I wasn't allowed to talk to anybody, but I had the recording. He never said it. Never said it. Um, and then he said, I've since learned that you have shared aspects of the meeting with others on campus. This is disappointing. I did speak people on campus because they had heard directly from you. However, I did not discuss the content of the meeting. <laughs> um, so then he ended the email saying, please consider this email a reiteration that the expectation is that the contents of the meeting remain confidential. My, my, my. I hadn't signed any NDA, wasn't even offered an NDA yet. Uh, I hadn't, he had never said to keep it confidential yet I get this email and I'm like wow like who loses their job and then is told you're not allowed to talk about it to anyone you're not allowed to investigate recourse you're not allowed to ask anybody for help like certainly, who does that certainly not anything where there's just cause you know no. the, the only reason why no. you're really concerned is right that people will 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 find out that that right you don't really have a leg to stand on here right. I want to transition a little bit um okay to talk just about what's your headspace and your heart space right now you mentioned crying when you first heard of it I, I just oh yeah want, I want to understand there's a human toll with there's a human this. toll How of course processing it yeah. I mean, first I want to say, as I look at your book over your shoulder, How to Fight Racism, I mean, this is this is a big part of fighting racism. And there is a cost. There's a cost to following Jesus. We have to count the cost. There is a cost to standing up for what's right. We have to count that cost. There's a cost for speaking truth, which by its very nature is divisive. Because if something's true, it's true. That means something that's not true is not true. That doesn't mean everything in life is either or. In fact, I think the vast majority right, of life is gray and it can even be both and. But this is one of those situations where it's like, no, I just, I'm counting the cost. That doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. But it also means like, like okay, I've been hurt, but nothing compares to the black indigenous and other people of color who have been hurt in this country because of the oppression they have faced, whether it's a million microaggressions micro at a place where it's death by a thousand paper cuts, or whether it's macroaggressions because they're labeled with racial epithets or called names, or whether it's even worse than that, right? It's death. It's death because they're not allowed to exist in their black and brown bodies um, because they're always viewed as suspicious and untrustworthy, right? So yeah, I'm counting the costs. I have cried a ton and it's not a competition between who suffers, right? Like we, the fact is Martin Luther King Jr. was right. We are all interrelated. Mm. And also the scriptures are right. We are all connected in the body of Christ. When one suffers, we all suffer 
mm. whether we want to admit it or not. And that's the thing that's so disturbing about a decision like this. Yes, I've lost my job. I have no idea where I'm going to find another job. You know, Sam said the same thing when he talked to you. It's like, okay, I'm applying to as many places as I can. But that's not even the biggest issue here. The biggest issue here is that we have administrations at CCCUs who are shutting us down when all we're trying to do is say, you know what? I have black and brown sisters and brothers in Christ who are hurting. I hurt because they hurt. I want to teach you about this. I want to help develop empathy in you and compassion in you. I want you to understand that when Taylor says it has its multicultural philosophy statement, that that has to get legs to it. Mm -hmm. It can't just be, uh, right, we're all united in Christ and we all love each other. That takes care of it. You actually have to do something. Mm -hmm. Like we have to act. We have to speak out. And we have to say, you know what? I'm going to step aside and I'm going to follow you now. Because I think we need Black, Indigenous, and other people of color to lead us because we've been so blind to their pain and we have been so callous to their pain in many ways. Um, and I think that we should listen to them when they tell us they're hurting. So let's read their essays about that. I don't think we should tell, say that they're ridiculous or that they're exaggerating. I think we should say, oh my gosh, I am sorry. Because that's why your quotation is so important. You can't confess sin unless you first know what the sin is. Mm. And if you don't teach truth, you will never know mm. what sin is. Because you'll get to just gloss over it and continue on. So you have to have the truth first. Then you have confession. Then you have to have repentance. Jeez. Repentance isn't a dirty word. You know, <laughs> so, some people want to say reparations. That's a dirty word. No. Like how many Bible verses are that like if you steal from someone, you're supposed to repay them seven times. I think there's a verse in Leviticus like that. Other verses even make it more. What are we talking about here? What is repentance? Just lip service? I'm sorry, that's not repentance. Like I was always taught in my my church growing up, repentance, right? Is doing a 180 and heading that's in right. the other direction. That's right. right. So let's stop doing the things that hurt people. I don't, you know, I don't want to make it too simplistic, but to me at the root, it is it is as simple as be kind to one another, but also, but also look at the systems you have in place and understand who they're hurting how they're hurting, and then change the systems. You mm. have to. You can't You can't just walk around blindly and say, well, racism's just about me and me and Jamar. And as long as I'm nice to Jamar mm -hmm. and he's nice to me, we're good. Mm -hmm. No, because there's systems in place that may, you know, be oppressing me as a woman that certainly are oppressing people of color in this nation that are oppressing you know, the right to speech or whatever else. And so we, we need to fight for those liberties and those freedoms and, and to change the systems that cause oppression. And Where that's not that? Mark, that's not Marxist, by the way. <laughs> you know, like that's Jesus. <laughs> that, that might be in part Marxist, but right, Marxism comes up short because that's dialectical materialism. There's no spiritual reality there mm. for the full throttle, right? And I know there's all kinds of variations there. Right. Yeah, it's Jesus. That's Jesus. That's that's just Jesus. <laughs> well, you're a professor and a preacher too. Which well, is great. Um, I can I can get a little passionate. <laughs> as well, you should. Yeah. And as we're talking about passion, as we're talking about systems, let's talk about action steps. So you mentioned something yeah. called the CCCU. Yeah. Stands yeah. for. Council of Christian Colleges and Universities. Right, right. And you and Professor Sam have been in contact and you've come up with something, which I I, I wonder if you'd share yeah. with the group yeah. because it's about moving forward and enlisting help. And I also want to say as a caveat, um, Shirley Hookstra, who's the current uh, president of CCCU, she's been supportive of me and my work, invited me to speak Good. at their yeah. triennial conference. Um, we corresponded back and right. forth when I did the podcast series, Those Meddling Kids, Unmasking the Anti-CRT Crusade in Christian Higher Ed. Yeah. So, so, so there's context there, there's relationship there, but you also want to enlist them 
as you, yes. Dr. Sam, and others are going through this. So tell us about what you've what you've. Yes. Yeah. I mean, Sam, um, as I was watching Sam's uh, story, you know, in the media over the last couple of months, I'm like, man, I really need to talk to him. But, um, you know, uh, I had to hire a lawyer. Taylor had told me hire a lawyer. And so we were going through some things and eventually I decided no, you know, and I, I, I just need to publicly speak out like Sam did. I need to follow his lead. And so as he and I have talked, we, you know, I'm hearing from friends that other things are going on like this at other CCCUs too. That the words um, diversity, equity, and inclusion are now, you know, uh, and that's that's happened here too. That we've been told, no, you can't use those words. You know, we've been told, Taylor, only use the word multicultural. But like, I'm old enough to know that 25 years ago, multicultural and multiculturalism were bad words too. Yep. And in fact, that was one of the things that confused me about the Heritage Foundation suggestion, uh, going back to that just for a second, because uh, I, you know, I actually looked up the Heritage Foundation, you know, what, is, what do they say about multiculturalism? And, you know, they say things like multiculturalism as a social model uh, is wants to destroy or at least alter and replace America and the West with something else. And I'm like, what? Like, I. I don't see that as being consistent with Taylor's multicultural policy. So I'm confused, right? So anyway, Sam and I have talked, it's like, well, we're really concerned. Like we've lost our jobs. We're not getting our jobs back. We know that, but we are concerned because again, lives are at stake, mm -hmm. right? Jobs are one thing, bodies, lives, minds. That's a whole nother thing. So we, we have actually come together and written a statement just, really asking, even urging the CCCU to say, look, you have diversity, equity, inclusion on your website. You have DEI resources that you are promoting and asking CCUs, CCCUs to use. And yet you have member institutions acting contrary to what is, is truly I mean, I think, I believe, biblical teaching on how we are to treat those who are our brothers and sisters in Christ, but also those that we are supposed to just treat with dignity anyway, because they're humans created in the image of God. Right. And so that's what we've written up. I don't know if you want me to read it or if you just want to post it. It depends on how much time is left, but we have written I up think... something that just is calling upon the CCCCU to say something and to act. As we close out, why don't we just why don't you just read that so we know okay. kind of framing what you're you're asking for because this is a bigger issue than two individual professors. It's a bigger issue than two particular schools. It is part of a wave, a movement, right. a crusade, as I called it, to um, tamp down on this racial justice instruction precisely at the point when we need more of it, not yes. less. And right. so, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Political trends that seek to limit what can and cannot be said about racism are increasingly infiltrating higher education in the United States. Christian colleges and universities are no exception. In March 2023, Dr. Sam Jockel was terminated by member institution Palm Beach Atlantic University after a single parent complained to the university president that Jockel's racial justice unit was indoctrinating students. Jockel had been at the university for over 20 years and had been teaching a unit on racial justice without complaint for 12 years. Likewise, on May 1, Professor Julie L. Moore made public that she'd lost her job at Taylor University, another member institution, on January 27, 2023. In particular, Moore's provost cited Taylor's concerns related to the fact that her thematic college composition course asks students to engage in reading and writing assignments about racial justice. How many other faculty and staff members at CCCU institutions have already encountered similar fates? How many are presently facing similar pressures? And most importantly, how many Black, Indigenous, and other people of color have suffered under the weight of racial injustice at CCCU institutions? It is time for the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities to take a public stand on this issue of all institutions of higher learning, Christian colleges and universities should be safe spaces to discuss race 
and to condemn racism as we live out the gospel of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we call upon the CCCU to do the following. One, publicly chastise Palm Beach Atlantic University and Taylor University. Two, require member institutions to safeguard academic freedom for professors who teach about race and racism. Three, acknowledge that systemic racism exists and is related to, but not the same as, individual racial prejudice. Four, apologize to BIPOC faculty, staff, and students for the CCCU's negligence in holding its member institutions accountable for the crushing weight of white supremacy embedded in their own campus cultures. And fifth and finally, hold its member institutions accountable for implementing and maintaining diversity, equity, and inclusion policies consistent with the CCCU's own, quote, commitment to racial justice and racial reconciliation, unquote, as well as with its acknowledgement that the, quote, history of the human race is replete with profound racial discord, unquote. Professor Julie, thank you so much for that. As we close out here, how can we support you personally as you're going through this? I welcome all prayers. Uh, the Quakers have a wonderful saying about, I will hold you in the light. So hold me in the light, hold my family in the light. I do have a daughter to support and um, I need a job, obviously. But I don't want, I don't want this just to go away you know, when I get a job or Sam gets another job, like I want, I want to continue the work that really my experiences at Wilberforce instilled within me experiences that I am sure were orchestrated by the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. that this is not, this is not, as I would tell my students over and over again, this isn't a political issue. I mean, it is, but it's not, it's a gospel issue. And that is absolutely true, right? God's not American. He's not Democrat or Republican. He is the God of all of us. And he cares and loves for all of us. And American politics cannot cloud our process of discernment about what is and isn't true. We need the Bible for that. And great teachers like you, Jamar. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> this will not be the last we hear from you. I've got a, a Substack post where you generously share your story in detail, and this is a developing story. So thank you for sharing it with us. We are holding you in the light. And thank you. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm.